Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we'll go on to uh, the agenda for this uh, afternoon. We're going to give you a high-level overview for income tax, a high-level overview of sales tax. We're going to get into nexus considerations by industry, and then we're going to close things out with recent developments in state income tax. So to kick things off, we have our first polling question. How did you hear about this webinar? A Cherry Beckert tax advisor, email from Cherry Beckert, friend or colleague, Terry Beckett alum or a social media post? Give you a little time to get your information in. I feel like we should have some Jeopardy music going on while uh, we're waiting. So we'll go on to the, the next slide. So new year, new nexus. Uh, so typically we recommend clients to, you know, maybe review their nexus every two years to determine, you know, whether or not they've entered new states, if there's a, a large transaction. Um, nexus is broadly defined as a connection. It's a minimum connection between a, a taxpayer and a state allowing the state to impose its taxing laws on the taxpayer. Historically, uh, nexus has been imposed with you, when you have a physical presence in the state, but as the digital age has continued to evolve, nexus has taken on a, a broader meaning in whether or not you have uh, nexus with the state. So we've gone on to economic presence nexus, which post Wayfair, you know, Wayfair was a landmark case, which essentially was a sales tax case, which stated that, you know, you no longer need to have physical presence in a state if you have at least 200 transactions or 100K in state sales collected and remitted tax, then you now have nexus with the state. And so we've gone from this now, you, you, you needed to have physical presence in a state to now economic nexus, which is exploiting a market in a state, having sales in a state which now a state has the authority to bring you in and tax you on those, those sales. Now, I must note that uh, the Wayfair case was a sales tax case, but states are now more emboldened to impose income tax nexus on companies because now they have the information that you are doing business within their state, state laws. So economic presence nexus is, could be broken up into two different categories, a factor presence nexus and doing business, doing business nexus. Essentially, factor presence nexus is such that when you have either 50,000 or 25% or more of your total property within a state, state can impose nexus on, you, on your business, or you have 50,000 or more, or 25, at least 25% of your total payroll within a state, the state can impose nexus, or 500,000 or 25% of your total sales within a state, which will allow for a state to impose nexus. So the MTC, which is the Multi-State Tax Commission, first uh, proposed this kind of standard for business activity in the state, and it imposed a standard to allow for a substantial nexus to be imposed if you exceed any of these uh, aforementioned thresholds. So this is kind of a, a heat map of where we have factor presence nexus within the U.S. Uh, the green is the only state that actually conforms to the MTC standard, which is that 50,000 or more of payroll of payroll property or 500,000 or more of, of, total, of sales. Uh, the rest of the states kind of partially conform to the MTC uh, standards. And then the purple, of course, is they don't conform. But states have oftentimes, if they haven't conformed to the MTC standard, they've adopted or they've taken their guidelines and imposed it into their state statute. So you, they don't necessarily uh, have to conform, but they have it in their state laws now. So the doing business standard Essentially, it's much broader. It's kind of uh, states without this factor presence nexus standard will have like a bright line and seek to impose income tax nexus if you're doing some type of business within their state. And so this is a broad term. And some states, we've called out a few states, have imposed doing business nexus for the privilege of earning or receiving income in the state. And this is kind of fluffy language. It's essentially stating if you're doing business, exploiting the market within the state, they can now impose a tax nexus 
or pull you into their state to impose an income tax on the business you do in that state. Other states have kind of called out if you transact or authorized to transact business, which means you're you know registered with the Secretary of State in the in the in the jurisdiction, they can now impose tax on you. So they've kind of taken this economic press economic presence thought and broadly applied it to either you have these factor presence right line tests that you uh, pass the threshold, or you're actually exploiting the market within the state. And so for the privilege of exploiting the market within the state, you now have uh, nexus and actually a filing requirement perhaps in the state. Okay, now that we've talked about um, income tax nexus, we'll dive into sales tax physical nexus. It's a little bit simpler than the income tax standards. So um, inventory, where you're storing inventory in a state, um, those who are storing it in a 3PL, a third party logistics, or in a fulfillment center, um, that counts even though, and we'll talk about this later, even though the inventory may not be completely under your control, it still can, is considered a nexus creating activity. Um, where you have a buildings, like think of it like office, warehouse, showroom, any kind of physical brick and mortar kind of presence in the state will give you physical nexus. Um, for the workforce, oh, can you go back, Maddie? For the workforce, it really depends, you know, you have to look at all your employees. You have to look at W-2s, remote employees, and even 1099 contractors. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that 1099 contractors will create nexus for them in the state, and they do. And lastly, for services, um, if you're, you know, getting a third party to provide a service in a state for you, such as installation, that too can create physical nexus in the state. Okay, so that's physical nexus. Now economic nexus. It's very similar to what Edward was talking about earlier. Um, the only the only difference is some of the things he didn't um, touch on was that for sales tax. You know, every pretty much most of the states use hundred thousand dollars or two hundred transactions, but the bigger states dropped the two hundred transactions and they just went with bigger thresholds. So New York, California, Texas all have bigger thresholds. Um, they're around five hundred thousand, I think, for all three of them. Another thing to look at, and we'll also discuss this later, is the measurements. Um, all the states use different measurement standards for how to measure whether or not you have economic nexus in the state. So you are not necessarily counting all your sales in the state. Um, for services, can you go back, Mike? Yeah, for services, it depends on the state and it depends on the service. Um, most states don't count services in the threshold, but you know it just really like everything in sales tax depends on the state. You know, So it depends on whether or not um, that state counts that. And then lastly, Missouri, is the last state to fall in the, the dominoes of economic nexus. And they um, it, they established that on January 1st, 2023. They went with $100,000 in sales, no transaction threshold, and they based theirs on tangible personal property. Okay, so for the measurements and the dates, one of the questions you have to ask yourself when you're looking at economic nexus for sales tax is, what do you count in that number? Um, you know. Do you count wholesale sales? You know, it's in most states you do. What about exempt sales? It's about 50 50. Um, marketplace sales, even though the marketplace is, you know, collecting the sales tax and remitting it, most states still say you have to count the marketplace sales in your trend in your calculation for both transaction and for dollar amount. And then sales by related entities. So if you have a sister company and they're selling something in a state, there are a couple of states that you have to consider that too and add that into your um, thresholds. For the evaluation period, um, there's several different variations. You know, some look at previous current calendar year, some look at previous and current calendar year. There's a rolling 12 month that several states have. And of course, there's always those outliers. So New York and Minnesota have different evaluation periods. All of this can make it very complicated to figure out exactly where you have economic nexus. And this leads us to polling question number two. Economic nexus concerns only apply to sales tax, true or false? So we'll give you guys a little while and uh, answer that. While we're waiting, it seems um, folks are asking about when will the recording be available. Um, Maggie, I did see your note in the chat that looks like about a week out. So just wanted to let folks know. 
Good job, guys. So that is correct. It does not only apply to sales tax, as we discussed earlier, as Edward discussed, it also applies to income tax. So we're going to dive into the industry areas now. So the first one's going to be manufacturers and supply chain. So one area from an income tax standpoint that's always been a consideration with manufacturers is Public Law 86-272. This law has been on the books uh, since 1959. Um, and essentially what the law says is that a state can't subject an out-of-state taxpayer um, to income tax when the only business activities that are being conducted in the state are the solicitation of sales for tangible personal property. So historically, many manufacturers have relied on Public Law 86-272 where they don't have operations. Um, and, and, they've, and they've used this as a basis to not file income tax returns because typically they only solicit and ship products into many of these other states where they don't have manufacturing processes. So when does uh, Public Law 86-272 apply? I, I think the key takeaway to this slide is that it only applies to state income taxes and for sellers of tangible personal property. It does not apply to sellers of services or other tax types such as franchise taxes, net worth taxes, gross receipts-based taxes, and other similar taxes. Uh, so the Multi-State Tax Commission, um, as Edward mentioned earlier, it, they're an intergovernmental tax agency and, and basically tasked with promoting fairness amongst the states uh, and how the state's tax laws are administered. Um, and what they typically do is provide guidance and tax policy recommendations for the states then to adopt. Um, so what the MTC has recently done is they've actually changed their position on Public Law 86-272. Um, and in regards to how that law interacts with internet-based activities. So under, under the new guidance, activities such as placing internet cookies on customer devices, especially cookies that, have, that market new products or services, will create income tax nexus. Other website functions, such as uh, providing post-sale online support, either through a chat or email, um, offering extended warranty plans and, and even providing job application access um, where candidates can uh, upload their resume. Um, those are all now going to be considered nexus creating activities in the eyes of the MTC. Um, however, the MTC does say that internet cookies that only support the solicitation of the sales process. So, for example, the use of a shopping cart. And, and I like to think of that as when you're purchasing products like off a website, um, you know, when, when they save your credit card or your address information or your previous sales, so you can kind of reorder, those are, those are generally going to be considered acceptable cookies. Um, where the cookie nexus comes into play is, is what I call these smart cookies that take basically a user's purchase history and they market new products and services to them. Um, those are the cookies that are generally going to be the nexus creating cookies. Um, it's also worth noting um, that just because the MTC has updated their guidance, it does not mean that this is the law of the land. States still also need to formally adopt these measures in order for them to have effect. All right, so as of right now, California and New York um, are the first two states to, to provide guidance on these MTC changes. I know everyone on this webinar is absolutely shocked that it is California and New York are the first. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that New York also hasn't formally adopted these changes. Um, right now, they're included in their draft regulations on the corporate side, which are still in the process of being uh, finalized. So, But it does show the intent of where the department is heading as far as uh, where their guidance on MTC is. Um, we're also expecting more states to kind of jump on this bandwagon since uh, it will potentially bring in more tax revenue to the states from a lot of these out-of-state manufacturers. So I think it's really important that manufacturers and sellers of tangible personal property um, consider you know, whether or not they need a nexus review, uh, especially with these new guidelines. Um, I think it's going to have a, a, a broad lasting effect uh, in this space. Thanks, Peter. Next, we're gonna look at how changes in the distribution channels can impact Nexus. Um, marketplace obviously includes Amazon, eBay, Etsy, 
But large retailers uh, like Walmart and Kroger, they're also starting to establish their own marketplaces. Um, Tiffany touched on this earlier, but your inventory stored in marketplace warehouses will create physical presence in that state and thereby create physical nexus. Um, it's important to note uh, if your current nexus full uh, footprint is small and you start selling on Amazon, Amazon has warehouses in upwards of 40 states. So as your inventory starts moving into these Amazon warehouses, you can very quickly uh, start establishing a physical presence in 10, 20, or 30 additional states. Uh, drop, shipping, drop shipping is very popular among e-commerce startups, uh, typically before they move into the marketplace. Uh, drop shipping does not create physical nexus, not typically. Um, what's unique about drop shipping is it involves two transactions. Uh, there's the supplier to you, the seller, transaction, and then you, the seller, to the customer. Uh, the key point with the, the supplier to seller is you need to ensure that your supplier has a valid resale certificate. Um, most states uh, will accept resale certificates from another state, your home state, um, but there are a handful of states uh, where that uh, resale certificate is not valid, and they will require you to register in their state to obtain their resale uh, exemption certificate. So it's important that if you're doing drop shipping in this handful of states, that you register so you can get your supplier in those states a valid uh, a valid certificate. Uh, Kevin, can I just make a point for a second on the marketplace um, inventory in Amazon? Is you're right that it's in like 40 plus states, but Amazon does not notify you when they move your inventory around and they like to move it around all the time. So just be aware that you could think you only have, you know, inventory in 10 states, but until you pull an inventory report, you really don't know. And it, they could be moving it daily. Yes. Uh, so following up on the supplier to seller transactions, Again, a valid uh, a valid uh, exemption certificate. If you don't provide that supplier with a valid resale certificate and that supplier does not charge you sales tax, it could open the door for you as the seller to have consumer use tax obligations. Uh, and finally, just taking a look at you, the seller, the transaction to the customer, it's just important to note that those sales contribute towards the economic threshold that's set by each state. So back just a moment. So basically your drop shipping sales combined with sales from all your other distribution channels, when they hit that threshold uh, for economic nexus uh, set by the state, then you have a new obligation. So new nexus comes those new obligations. Uh, there's new compliance obligations. So you now may be required uh, to register uh, in additional states. You may also have new uh, sales and use tax uh, return filing obligations. Um, and some of those uh, returns are going to have different filing frequencies. So the question then becomes, well, who's going to manage uh, the compliance process? Is that going to be an individual or a team internally? Is that going to be outsourced? Or are you going to consider uh, yeah, compliance management software. Uh, the final point uh, on obtaining uh, a resale certificate, uh, again, that goes back to that drop shipping and those states that require you to register to get their resale certificate. Uh, and that ties into the next set of bullets, uh, your obligations with yeah, exemption certificate management. And like, do you need to provide additional exemption or resale certificates? And similar to the compliance side, who's going to be tasked with managing these certificates, making sure that they are not expired, making sure that they're valid? Um, again, is that an individual? Is that going to be outsourced? Or are you going to use a yeah, certificate uh, management software? Uh, and, and the thing to consider is what certificate management system works best for you? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so the next industry that we're actually going to tackle is in the technology and services space. So 
as previously discussed, um, economic nexus, um, it also applies to income tax. It's not just sales tax. So as a result, um, these economic nexus provisions generally impact, uh, I think, technology and service industries specifically more often than others, uh, especially um, since often customers for these types of businesses are not necessarily in the same states um, as the company generally operates. Um, as a result um, of this and the changing economy, um, states over time have kind of shifted how they source revenue from services. So historically, before the age of, of computers and, and all of that, services were generally kind of sourced to where they were performed and where are those costs of those services. Um, however, since more and more services seem to be provided remotely, um, that's really kind of birthed this uh, market-based sourcing approach, um, which really focuses more on where your customers are located and where those benefits of those services are received as opposed to where are you actually performing them. So, you know, in today, um, you know, approximately 36 states or so have now switched to some capacity to a market-based sourcing methodology. Um, and, and that trend is really only going to continue. So due to these changes in the sales apportionment uh, methodologies, technology and other service providers, uh, they really need to consider whether they have gaps um, and where they're filing state income tax returns. Uh, an, another complexity um, is that states also have different rules on how services should be sourced, uh, depending on the type of entity that the company is. So C-Corps, uh, for example, might have different rules than certain pass-through uh, entities. So entity choice is uh, an important decision on you know, when you're going to be headquartered for a certain type of business that could all impact that. Uh, lastly, you know, why, why is this a real concern? Well, unlike manufacturers and other sellers of, of tangible personal property, um, Public Law 86272 protection does not extend to service providers. So a, a common issue that we see um, is during the due diligence process. So if a company is, is ready to sell, um, oftentimes these issues can rear their ugly head and uh, from due, due diligence teams. Um, and a lot of times they take the worst case uh, scenario when they're doing this analysis, which can really harm a company's valuation uh, from a pricing standpoint. Um, so we always recommend that our clients think about these nexus issues and whether or not they have these gaps, especially if a sale is anticipated in the near future. And I'd like to jump in there real quick, Peter, and highlight one of the points you made especially in this post-pandemic era and we have, you know, telecommuting or remote employees, uh, clients really have to be cognizant of the fact you may have an employee in one state, but the customer is in a totally different state. And so for sourcing purposes, you wouldn't necessarily source your receipts to, let's say, where that employee is working. You may end up sourcing it to where the customer is located or where the actual benefit of those services are received. And so you really have to take a, a holistic approach in looking at your the whole process to know where those receipts and what the state rules actually state for where those receipts should be sourced. It's not the traditional sources to wherever your customer is located anymore. Though things are really changing rapidly in terms of sourcing and where you should source and those type of issues. Right. That, that's a great point, Edward, especially, you know, as, you know, post as we're exiting COVID and, you know, there's still going to be a continuation of re a remote workforce to some capacity. If not, some some companies have permanently adopted that. So that's a great point that that needs to be considered. It's not just well, our company's here. Uh, well, you have employees all over the United States potentially now. So you, those are a lot of a lot of ramifications to think through. And on that note, talking about sourcing, um, for sales tax, sourcing for technology is really big because wh where do you source something that you don't have a physical product? Um, and the states use, most states use basic waterfall level. So the first level is based on where the customer takes possession of the item. So this would be, you know, any kind of a storefront. So if there is some kind of a physical product, you know, this would be if they take possession at the storefront, that would be where you source the sale. The second level is based on where the customer receives the benefit of the service or where the user sits. Um, this can be difficult when you've got a lot of users or you don't know where the benefit of the service is or where the user sits. 
And then third is um, if the address is unknown for where the project is received, you use the billing address. And this is pretty typical with technology sales. If there's multiple users involved, um, the customer can provide a multiple points of use MPU certificate, and then they remit the use tax to the states based on where the users are sitting. So there's a lot to consider when looking at sourcing for technology. All right, and then a few other um, sales tax considerations for technology. Some of the largest causes of sales tax nexus for technology companies is the volume of sales, um, especially transactions. A lot of technology companies have a lot of transactions. Um, and employees, a, a lot of technology companies have 1099 remote employees everywhere. You know, so they really need to be looking at that. They need to be looking at their um, their census, their employee census of where everyone is sitting. And then keep in mind that um, nexus and taxability are separate. You know, so you can have nexus in a state, but it could be that your your product or your service isn't taxable in that state. So you have to kind of do, like bring those two apart in your mind. You know, and you could have a taxable product and not have nexus in the state. So don't just automatically think because you have nexus in a state, you have to start collecting sales tax because it really could be something that's not even taxable there. There's a couple of states that have changed the way they um, either define their services or changed their taxability this past year. Kentucky, um, as of January 1st, started charging sales tax on 35 new services, including SAS. Um, so that was a big change. So if you're not looking at Kentucky now, you need to be um, if you're selling SAS. Um, and any of the other 35 services that are now taxable there. And then Maryland updated their statute to exclude the sale of digital products for business use. Um, they did have it where digital products were taxable for everyone, and they came back and said that really wasn't the intent of the law when it was passed. And so they are now excluding it for business use, which um, affects a lot of, of companies where they're selling things to other businesses. And next, we want to move to nexus considerations for the localities. And the big takeaway here is that the locals do not have to follow or don't always follow the guidelines for nexus or taxability established by the state. In most states, states they do, but there are exceptions. Uh, for example, Colorado. In Colorado, establishing economic nexus at the state level will establish economic nexus uh, for the home rule cities that participate in the model ordinance. Um, ones that do not participate in that, really in Colorado as a whole, the home rules are, are permitted to set their own, you know, their own rules. Um, kind of a one-off uh, exception, and, and there are others, uh, in Illinois. So you may not have uh, economic or physical uh, nexus in the state of Illinois, but you could have economic or physical nexus in the city of Chicago. Uh, there's other examples of that across the country, but the, again, the key takeaway is just be aware that the locals don't always follow the state. So polling question three, which are the following? is a reason to understand your state tax nexus footprint. A, expensive penalties and interest and years of backfiling returns. B, due diligence issues when a company is looking to sell or acquire another business. C, damage to a company's reputation. Or D, understanding your nexus footprint could help in developing tax planning strategies. And next, we're going to move into uh, the e-commerce industry. And the first thing we're going to touch on uh, is the metaverse. It is here. Uh, as Edward alluded to earlier, uh, the digital age is evolving. And this, the metaverse is the next phase of that, uh, of that evolution. Um, over the next six to seven years, experts expect that Metaverse sales will contribute nearly $3 trillion 
uh, in the e-commerce space. Uh, Tiffany touched on sourcing earlier. Uh, the greatest challenge for sellers doing business on the metaverse will be sourcing. You know, is there an obligation to collect tax? And if so, what's the correct tax rate? And who gets the tax? Right, Kevin? That is correct. I think the states are really trying to figure this out right now. So, okay. And then uh, talking about nexus for e-commerce. So the largest cause of sales tax nexus for e-commerce companies, as you can understand, as you can guess, would be the volume of sales, um, especially as we're coming out of COVID. We had a lot of um, online sales. I'm sure everyone stayed at home in their pajamas and just bought things off of the internet like, like I did. Um, so that just made the sales drive up in the past couple of years. And then inventory storage. Um, a lot of 3PL and Amazon inventory storage is the, the biggest things that will make e-commerce companies have nexus in a state. Um, and please uh, keep in mind that 200 transactions can hit a lot quicker than $100,000. So if you're selling an item that's small, um, you could have just a few thousand dollars worth of sales, but hit that 200 transactions. And so you really do have to look at both of them when you're looking at whether or not you have economic nexus. As we mentioned earlier, Missouri was the last uh, state to fall with the economic nexus law that went into effect January 2023. That means that every state that has sales tax now has an economic nexus law. Um, so you have to keep that in mind as you're as you're looking at different things. And as Kevin talked earlier about the locals, think about the fact that even like Alaska, who doesn't have a state sales tax, they do have economic nexus sales for locals. So keep that in mind when you're looking at things. Um, one of the interesting court cases that came about recently is in California, um, Online Merchants Guild versus Maduro's. And the Online Merchants Guild, they represent online sellers, mostly Amazon sellers. Um, we'll talk about them again in just a minute. But they, they went after the CDTFA, the California Tax um, Administration, saying that it was... Um, that they unconstitutional, basically, that they had to require sellers to have a sales tax permit in order to collect sales tax. So this uh, this has gone on for a couple of years now, and finally the court affirmed an earlier decision to say that they it was not against uh, the constitution to require a sales tax permit. So the online merchant scale plans to appeal that decision. Peter, you have some stuff to say about income tax and e Yeah, I just wanted to kind of just tack on to this slide just from an income tax standpoint. Um, I, I know e-commerce probably doesn't get a ton of publicity, you know, in the larger uh, sense, but there's a lot of smaller uh, e-commerce businesses that have had a lot of issues with states, particularly California and, and sometimes Texas and maybe some others where, um, you know, when they've registered for a sales tax permit, when that state finds out that they've been participating in Amazon FBA, they've been getting notices uh, that they're demanding income tax filings because of that inventory issue where Amazon can move your inventory throughout the U.S. without even your knowledge. Um, and that's going to that's been causing some income tax issues. Um, uh, a lot of it's uh, kind of controversial. Uh, a lot of it's uh, been dictated as a money grab by states like California, but um, we've had a flood of inquiries about this issue from a lot of our e-commerce clients. They've all gotten notices from California and some from Texas and some other states. So we've been working through a, a lot of those issues with a lot of our clients. And, um, you know, so I would implore those who have received notices from states, don't ignore them, don't throw them in the trash. Uh, it's important you reach out to your tax provider or reach out to us and we're happy to help you with it. Okay, and a few more points about um, e-commerce and Nexus is uh, consider registration. So when you're going to register, realize that every state is different. Um, it's like having 45 small countries all here in the United States because they all have their own system of doing what they what they want to do for registration purposes. And that um, with economic Nexus, a lot of the states will give you a grace period. Some of them will give you 30 days to register um, after you've reached the economic nexus threshold. Some of them will say by the beginning of the next quarter or by the even the beginning of the next year. So keep that in mind when you're going to register. Um, just keep an eye on it and also try to find out when the grace period ends. We talked about the measurements earlier. 
Um, know what economic nexus measurements the state uses because that can make a big difference in whether or not you need to register. So it could be that if they don't count marketplace transactions, you, maybe you don't even have economic nexus in the state once you take those out. Or if they don't count exempt sales, you may not have it. So it makes a huge difference in the, with the measurement. For um, timeline, we talked about this, the look back when you're going to measure. Um, just pay attention to whether or not they're using a rolling 12 months or current year plus calendar um, plus previous year. That makes a difference. And I get this question a lot if the thresholds start over at the beginning of the year, and typically they do not. Um, there might be one or two states out there that will start over because they only count current year, but almost all of them count current year plus previous year or a rolling 12 months. Um, and that also leads to the question about kind of jumping in and out of sales tax accounts. It's not something we recommend for sure because you never know when you're going to get Nexus again um, and you don't want to be caught unaware and not collecting when you need to be. But one of the things you need to think about is trailing Nexus. So with trailing Nexus, you could have, you know, lose Nexus in a state, but the state can still require you to collect and remit for six to 12 months after you stop having Nexus in the state, um, just to make sure that you don't get Nexus again, because definitely states don't like it if you jump in and out of sales tax accounts. So keep in mind, not every state has trailing Nexus, but if you're looking to close your sales tax account, take a look at that before you move forward. And then um, we kind of talked about this earlier. This was a huge case for e-commerce this past year. So in 2022, um, the Online Merchants Guild that we talked about earlier, they went, um, they went after Pennsylvania and um, they had a court case against Pennsylvania's position that inventory in a marketplace fulfillment center creates nexus. And so they, um, they sued. And this case went on for a while, and we kind of weren't really sure how this was going to come out. And the guild's position was that, you know, Amazon controls the inventory. They control where it's being stored. They control when it gets moved around. And therefore, you know, the FBA seller doesn't know where their inventory is. It can't be their nexus in, in a state. And uh, the court ruled that this, if the seller's only connection with the state was the inventory being stored in the fulfillment center, it does not constitute enough next enough of a presence in that state for physical nexus. Um, I think everyone was kind of surprised by this. We're we're excited to see what happens with this moving forward. Pennsylvania um, Department of Revenue decided to not appeal the decision, which also was surprising. And so then the question becomes. What other states are going to follow behind this? You know, is, is the Online Merchants Guild going to go after other states? Is this setting a precedence moving forward? Yeah, Tiffany, I'll, I'll just uh, jump on this as well. Th this was also a decision for income tax as well. So it, um, it wasn't just a sales tax issue. There's an income tax now position because of uh, un under um, due process to potentially argue for other states that, you know, they lack the due process nexus to, to really say that I need to file a tax return. So um, it is interesting to see how this will play out in other states. Definitely. Okay, time for polling question number four. When was the last time you performed a nexus review? Less than six months ago, between six months and 18 months ago, more than 18 months ago, or never, what is Nexus? I would say if the answer is never, <laughs> you should probably reach Yes. Out. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I was going to say, Peter. If your answer is D, never, what is Nexus, we need to have a discussion. Right, right. This is probably a, a good time as ever to a uh, shameless plug, but uh, <laughs> we do have this Enterprise Nexus tool, which is it's a pretty cool tool. It, it's minimal effort in terms of information that you got to provide, but it spits out a, a very extensive report using logic and the state rules that will help you and guide you in making decisions in terms of nexus and filing obligations in the various states. Wow, look at that. We're almost evenly split. Look at that, <laughs> four ways. Um, so you 22% that said never, what is Nexus? <laughs> like email me at the end, you'll see my contact information and we'll talk. <laughs> All right. So we're getting to uh, recent developments now. Um, so the first recent developments is we're just gonna touch upon different issues and different court cases that have come about uh, in over the years. So the first is matter of TD Ameritrade. Uh, 
So there was an attempt by the taxpayer to source fees paid by the banks to the broker dealer for marketing, record keeping, and support services. And New York is one of the states, it has pretty extensive broker dealer rules and guidance. And so the TD Ameritrade was trying to source the receipts from these services to the brokerage clients. And the administrative law judge rejected that argument and pretty much held that the fees must be sourced to the location of the bank, i.e. the customers. Uh, this case, essentially, just like the, the case out of Ohio, it's taxpayers trying to source receipts, not based on where their customer is located, but based on where, there's, where their customer's customers are located. They're trying to look through to source the receipts there. And, and states vary on their position, but state the, in this case, particularly, they rejected that argument. Um, in this Ohio case, Defender Security uh, versus McLean, an authorized dealer of security systems made sales of security monitoring services contracts to consumers and assign those contracts to ADT. The court held that the payments for the assigned contracts are sourced to the location of ADT and not ADT's customers. So again, the, the taxpayer was trying to look through the, their actual customer, which was uh, ADT, but to AT and ADT's customers uh, in, in terms of sourcing that the receipts and that revenue from those uh, contracts. This case is essentially, it's a, it's a huge case for anyone who has Texas or who is located in Texas or who has Texas customers. And essentially, SiriusXM, which is a case where that issue was Texas's sourcing of receipts from services. So the revenue from services were sourced to Texas when the services were performed in the state, which is kind of the, the customer location is in the state. But the Texas Appellate Court ruled on November 10th that Sirius's cost performance analysis was sufficient to support its conclusion that the services were performed where, not where the, as Texas's uh, statute state, not where the receipt producing and product act occurred, which is typically the customer's location, but where the costs associated with uh, the, the, the receipts is located. And so if you're a Texas client or you're a Texas based uh, company, you would source the receipts instead of outside to where your customers are located, they will be sourced to where the, the, the costs or where you have people actually performing the services. So this is a big case that occurred over the past year and it's, it's very essential if you're doing any type of business in Texas that you review the, sur the sourcing of those receipts because it could be an adverse uh, result if you're Texas based or it could be a, a potentially good result if you're not out in, in Texas, but you've been historically sourcing receipts based on this, you know, market-based, I have customers in, in Texas approach. So you could potentially, you know, look for refund opportunities or things of that nature based on, you know, historical uh, sourcing rules. So this next case is uh, NASCAR holdings. And essentially this case is, is, is important because, well, first of all, background on the case. Uh, so NASCAR, the commissioner assessed uh, NASCAR for commercial activity tax on receipts from sales from race broadcasting rights to Fox. They also held that uh, media revenue, licensing revenue, and sponsorship fees that NASCAR generated would be subject to the cat. However, the court held that the revenue that was generated from this broadcast revenue, media revenue, licensing re fees, and sponsorship fees are not subject to the Ohio cat, essentially stating that uh, essentially stating that the, the, the receipts, they should not go to where the, the customers or the folks located in Ohio weren't the, the recipients of the rights. It was a broadcast to the overall, uh, to, to everyone. And, and the folks in Ohio weren't the only recipients of, of, of those sourcing of those receipts. And so the decision for, in NASCAR, it essentially, it, it contributes to the conversation that, you know, states are sourcing revenue based on as noted previously in the Ohio and the, uh, the TD Ameritrade case, they should be sourcing receipts to the location of their customer rather than the location of their customer's customers, which is what they tried to do here in this, uh, this Ohio uh, NASCAR case. And so oftentimes the contracts are the, the, the guiding principle when you're looking at the sourcing of revenue and what the contract actually states in terms of where the revenue should be sourced. And so those are essentially what you, sh you should be looking at. All right, so now I'm, I'm going to talk about this Target Enterprise case in, in Florida uh, that was fairly recent. And 
Um, this is an interesting case because anyone who's who's dealt with the Florida Department of Revenue knows that from a statutory perspective, the state has cost performance sourcing rules on the books. Um, however, the department has always kind of tried to argue that Florida is a market-based sourcing state. So if you look at any of the uh, technical assistance advisements, uh, they will try to tie in that Florida is a market-based state uh, and use some sort of language that the income producing activity is, is ultimately where the customer received the service. And uh, that's basically been the department's long, uh, long-standing position. Um, so in this case, one of Target's uh, subsidiaries, TEI, was audited by the state and they were assessed about $10 million. Uh, TEI basically provides you know, various marketing services for Target internally. And um, basically the, the state tried to argue that TEI should use a different methodology for sourcing revenue. Their argument was that they should take the square footage uh, in their Florida stores compared to the US presence uh, square footage and, and use that as an appropriate basis to apportion revenue. Um, well, the, the court, uh, Target obviously appealed this and the, and the court rejected the department's position uh, in favor of Target. And, and they basically concluded that, listen, 95% of their payroll and these services are being performed outside of the state of Florida. Um, they're, they're based in Minnesota, so they're, the services are all being rendered in Minnesota. These aren't Florida sales under the statute. So they, they really did reject their square footage test uh, by, used by the department. So that was an interesting case. Um, and, and this California case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the state has provided guidance around the new MTC rules uh, regarding public law 86-272. Now the, AM, the ACMA, which is one of the nation's uh, leading trade organizations, is of course not happy about this uh, for their constituents and they're challenging uh, these rule changes in California. Uh, basically their argument um, is that California didn't follow the proper procedure in issuing these new rules, but also that they contradict not only public law 86272 itself, but they violate the constitution. So. This is going to be an interesting uh, development that we're definitely paying attention to because this could have some broader ramifications. Okay, and then last we're going to talk about the uh, Massachusetts case, which is, again, very interesting. Um, this has been going on in Massachusetts for, for quite a while. Back in 2017, um, Massachusetts had a statute that they, that they passed um, establishing cookie nexus. And I know Peter discussed that earlier and saying that if you had cookies or apps on a device stored in the state, then that constitutes, constituted physical nexus in the state. Um, they, they stood by this, they, they, you know, throughout this, like the past five years. And when Wayfair came along, you know, they said that if you now had economic nexus in the state, and you previously had these cookies and stuff on devices that you could go Wayfair all the way back. They could go all the way back to 2017 with Wayfair, even though the case wasn't decided until June of 2018. Um, so this, this has kind of been going on back and forth. Um, the US Auto Parts Network you know, brought it up in this past um, year. And so in December of 2022, the, the um, Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court said that no, that these cookies on devices were not um, enough to give people a physical presence prior to Wayfair, that they couldn't hold people to Wayfair prior to when the law was, was um, passed. And so that's that's a huge um, step, you know, for Wayfair is, you know, can these states hold people to Wayfair before the Wayfair laws passed? You know, in South Dakota, the argument there, you know, when the law was passed was that there wouldn't be retroactivity, right? That they wouldn't retroactive um, hold them, hold sellers to it. And so this was a good step for sellers in saying that no, Massachusetts couldn't hold people to a 2017 law, you know, for in, for Wayfair standards. Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing, Tiffany, as well as just due to the cookies, uh, I feel like this is just the beginning of a lot, a laundry list of legislation headed down states past as far as the cookies are concerned with the new 86 to 72 guidance. Yes. 
you know, the, this cookie challenge, I think is going to be, um, it, it's going to be challenged in a lot of states that adopt it. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out as well. Yeah, and this was really big several years ago, if you remember, Peter, Cookie Nexus um, was really big before Wayfair. And I think a lot of states, once Wayfair hit and they saw the, the revenue they were going to get with Economic Nexus, they kind of let a lot of these other um, Nexus statutes kind of fall by the wayside, like Cookie Nexus. But Massachusetts has held strong this entire time that these cookies gave you physical Nexus in the state. Right. No, I agree. And uh It'll be interesting, too, because there's other areas that are going to be challenged. Um, I could see the online activities. I mean, what's the difference between you having a chat with somebody about your product or service and needing some uh, troubleshooting support or calling them? Because right. one of them might be protected, the other may not. And that's what's the difference? You're still communicating with another human being on the other side. Does it matter if it's through the Internet or through a phone or a satellite or however else it is. So it's going to be an interesting uh, topic to see uh, litigated over the coming years, that's for sure. For sure. And this takes us to our last polling question. Polling question number five. Would you like to learn more about how we can help you moving forward? So yes, no, maybe in the future. I don't know about you guys, but I'm hoping everyone answers yes, right? Because I'd like to meet everyone who is uh, on our webinar today. That's responded to a lot of email, Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and everyone emailed we have, Tiffany. We have great <laughs> participation. You're going to be busy. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of email, Maddie, do you yes. want to introduce the last slide? I sure will. Thank you guys so much. Uh, for everybody who is attending, feel free. I'm seeing some hand claps. Go ahead and do that. Celebrate our speakers today because you guys did such a great job. Kevin, Tiffany, Peter, um, Edward, great information, very valuable. And as they mentioned, you know, if you do still have some lingering questions, here's contact information on the slide in front of you. Uh, they are happy to set up some conversations, phone calls. Uh, Tiffany, all those emails, perhaps, <laughs> <laughs> and and keep the conversation going. Uh, just one last reminder, we do have a survey at the end of this session. You will be taken to it as soon as the session concludes. And with that, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you to the speakers, and we look forward to the next one. Mm -hmm.